There are two types of sailors. People like me, who buy an old boat, fix her up, take lessons from instructors, join yacht clubs to learn from others, and we race our boats. The other kind of sailor is what we like to call a credit card captain. <laughs> These are the folks with more money than cents. They purchase expensive equipment. They hire a crew. They take out absurdly high loans to buy their boats and rarely ever invest in safety. <laughs> when I first met my friend Mike, I had him pegged as a credit card captain. I met him through a Facebook group called Sailors in San Diego Crew Pool. He posted, looking to take a boat out? I can bring beer, let me know. <laughs> Not being one to turn down a beer, I agreed to take Mike out for a day sail on my boat, High Wind. Mike revealed that he had taken US Sailing 101 and wanted to learn all he could about how to handle a big boat so that he would be prepared when his custom-built Leopard 50 was ready. <laughs> he sold his, he sold his uh, house, his car, stocks, a classic Mustang, and put the remainder of his life savings into this boat to the tune of about one and a half million dollars. A far cry from my 1981 Down East 38, which I scooped up for a mere 18 grand in cash and was literally sinking in her slip. <laughs> At 43 years old, my boat barely qualifies as a millennial. <laughs> as Highwood moved gracefully past Mission Beach, I quickly got along with Mike. I admired his spirit and his passion for sailing, even if he was quite the novice. He was putting into motion a plan for his life that I knew was further out for me. I couldn't help but feel a little jealous. Various setbacks in my life had prevented me from executing my own plan. Mike had spent uh, a good deal of time talking about hyperinflation in the post-COVID economy, and I suspected maybe this was his version of going galt. <laughs> the Ayn Randian wet dream of fleeing society and subsisting purely on gold bars and rugged individualism. <laughs> A friendship developed, and for the next three years or so, I was Mike's boat Sherpa. <laughs> he frequently called me asking for advice, keeping me updated on the progress of the boat's construction, and even asking me to vouch for his sailing skills with his insurance company. Mike would take possession of the boat in Cape Town, South Africa, and sail to Annapolis. In spite of our truth stretching, both the bank and the insurance company insisted that he hire a captain to cross the world's second largest ocean. <laughs> I would join him, his wife Hannah, and Captain Paul on the last leg from Fort Lauderdale to Annapolis, approximately two weeks at sea. I arrived in Fort Lauderdale and I got to meet Paul for the first time. I instantly got along with Paul as we engaged in friendly debate about the merits of monohulls versus catamarans as we made various preparations for the final leg of the journey. Mike was his predictable fiery self, amplified by the fact that he had spent the last six weeks at sea being fueled entirely by cliff bars and adrenaline. <laughs> Hannah was not taking things so well. I didn't think reality had fully set in for her. The boat was now the family home. It was as if, as if she picked up the controller, selected the hardest difficulty setting, and started the game of life after skipping the tutorial level. <laughs> I imagined her inner dialogue, so this is my life now. Han always struck me as a type that seemed to just go along with the plan. Sometimes communicating with her proved difficult as she spoke with a thick, thick Vietnamese accent, especially when it came to obscure sailing uh, terminology. That and the fact that this was maybe the first time she had ever been on a sailboat. In any case, she was giving her absolute best effort. Two days before sh uh, shoving off, Captain Paul invited his childhood friend Kaz as we needed some additional crew. Kaz was a charter boat chef for nearly 20 years with an impressive sailing resume. She was a foil to Paul's reserved personality and matched Mike's fire ener energy. The first night, everyone got to witness a heated phone call between her and her charter company over a pay dispute and some missing boat equipment. Maybe it was just my own insecurity speaking, but I didn't take kindly to her referring to my life jacket as a fashion statement. 
Or condescendingly referring to my boat as nothing but a glorified day sailor. I rebutted with jokes about catamarans and credit card captains. Nonetheless, we had seven people on this boat, and only four of us knew how to sail, including Mike, and technically, this was his first voyage. So the best thing about Florida is that you get to leave Florida. <laughs> Unlike San Diego Bay, Fort Lauderdale's inland waters are a series of winding rivers through some of the wealthiest real estate on the East Coast. As we motored past dozens of Scarface-esque mansions, Mike, Mike's mood vi vacillated between unchecked anxiety and jubilation. One minute expressing how grand the whole experience was, and the next minute shouting at someone to have a fender ready as we came within spitting distance of moored boats, steel pillars, concrete barriers, and several power yachts coincidentally named Going Galt, <laughs> none of which would ever be actually capable of Going Galt. With fender in hand, Hannah only seemed to share in the anxiety portion of the experience as she wrangled dock lines. Kaz happily kept watch on the cockpit with Captain Paul, and I was on the starboard side of the boat with a fender, you know, those little inflatable rubber things that keep boats from bumping into things. I noticed that I had misread the channel markers where two branches of the river met. It occurred to me that I would have wrecked the boat if I had been at the helm, triggering a little bit of my previous insecurity. After several painstaking hours and an uncomfortably long wait for the final drawbridge, we were able to find open ocean, cut the motors, and set sail with the wind in our favor. The next several days were some of the smoothest sailing I've experienced in my life. We were visited by birds, dolphins, and whales. I even managed to make tacos for everyone on board with what I could find in the galley. And one whale came so close to the boat, causing a moment of panic as the depth alarm sounded just in time for him to breach about 30 yards behind the boat. To avoid a storm, we pulled into Beaufort, North Carolina, a town famous among seafarers as it marks the beginning of the graveyard of the Atlantic. <laughs> this famously dangerous 120-mile stretch of ocean has claimed countless small craft, several Confederate Navy ships during the Civil War, the Queen Anne's Revenge, and even U-352, a Nazi submarine. Yep, even Poseidon hates Nazis. <laughs> the storm we had avoided had left shifting winds and rough seas in its wake, leaving Kaz to question Paul's decision to leave when we did. Admittedly, I got a healthy dose of schadenfreude watching my Kaz and Paul argue as they spent 45 minutes struggling with an anchor in a shallow mud bottom creek in North Carolina. The second night back at sea was shaping up to be as uneventful as the first. I was on the midnight to 4 a.m. watch while everyone else on board was fast asleep. Sailing is 99% boredom and 1% stark terror. <laughs> and this was the boring part. Modern technology means that keeping watch uh, was nothing more than occasionally glancing at instruments and briefly scanning the horizon, looking for the faint lights of ships and other hazards. Missing just one could result in a collision, at best, an embarrassing call to Mike's insurance company, at worst, complete loss of craft and crew. As the mostly useless sails luffed violently with each wave pounding the boat, Hannah appeared in the cockpit, asking me a simple question. Are we lost? It took a minute to process the question as she repeated, are we lost? A tinge of panic faded quickly as a at a glance of the instruments told me that we were tracking the course Paul had plotted for us. Hannah had Google Maps open on her phone. <laughs> a billing issue with Starlink meant that her phone couldn't properly load all of the maps. A simple misunderstanding which caused her to share disproportionately in the stark terror as it served only to remind her that we were but a tiny, tiny dot on a large blue ocean. I found myself a little annoyed. The boat had a state-of-the-art navigation system, which alone cost more than my whole boat. Yet she was using Google Maps. <laughs> in retrospect, mentioning that we were in the middle of the graveyard of the Atlantic, probably not a good idea at the time. I said, I think it's time to wake up Paul and ask him what we should do. It's better to be safe than sorry. 
Running back down into the cabin, she returned with a visibly disgruntled Mike and not Paul. The argument escalated quickly, as one would expect, between a married couple on a boat, 300 nautical miles from precisely fuck all. As this was no time to let our guard down, I desperately tried my best to appeal to reason, but forgot that logic doesn't always win when emotions are tense. The shouting had now awakened Paul and Kaz, neither of whom were thrilled at the situation. Mike and Hannah talking over each other, each concerned with proving the other wrong. Kaz quickly sided with Hannah, shouting loudly at Mike. Let's not be kidding. I've dated men like you. You think you're a nice person, but you're not. I know. <laughs> Paul quietly listened, waited, and finally interjected. Both sink when crews don't get along. When we're out here, we work as a team because we're a crew. Leave your ego at the dock. We can argue when we're back on land. The deafening silence filled the boat. Just for long enough for me to say, shit, I said out loud, as I realized I had gone an uncomfortably long time uh, since I had even bothered to look at the radar. <laughs> Thankfully, a quick read told me everything was fine, but there was always that chance that things could have gone wrong in those few mo moments when we lost our collective cool. Hannah retired to the master stateroom first, Mike shortly thereafter, but not before saying he had to fuck off to bed. Paul did a quick look at the instruments and gave me the nod to continue what I was doing as Kaz prepared some coffee for her morning, uh, for her morning watch. As I handed off watch to her, she did little to hide her contempt for Mike. Uh, she was certainly justified in how Mike acted. She was also completely oblivious to how her shouting did nothing but turn everyone's attention away from the most important part of sailing, getting the boat there safely. Kaz and I unpacked the event as I stayed up with her for a few hours and we rounded Cape Hatteras, marking the end of the graveyard of the Atlantic. Several days later, we finally made landfall. It had been just shy of two weeks at sea. I struggled to see Mike in the same light as before and certainly struggled, and certainly struggled to earn back the respect, uh, 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 and he certainly start, struggled to earn back the respect of the rest of the crew as we continued our passage. We celebrated our return to dry land with a few drinks, and a few more drinks. To use a nautical term, Kaz showed her true colors and eventually took a swing at Mike, who promptly sent her packing. <laughs> it was at that point I decided to visit the Annapolis Yacht Club for dinner and beer. I told the rest of the crew that it was a private club and only members were allowed. <laughs> While that was partially true, I really just needed some alone time. <laughs> I also didn't want to have to explain to my friends here at Southwestern Yacht Club why one of my guests made a scene in Indianapolis. And as I sat down with a beer and my dinner, I got to really reflect on everything in the past few weeks. I guess you don't get to know someone until you spend a few weeks at sea with them. Though in retrospect, I probably overlooked a few things here and there. Most boats can handle a rough sea, waves, and storms. What really sinks a boat is when her crew turns on each other and personality conflicts get the way of making the right decisions. Mike and Hannah continued their adventure, and we remain good friends to this day, and I've upgraded for him from credit card caps and status. <laughs> Hannah has become quite the sailor, logging a few thousand miles and a few hundred hours on watch as they continue their adventure. Whatever doubts Hannah had about the boat, about boat life, seemed to have faded by now. As for me, it motivated me to put my own plan into gear, leaving my ego at the dock, along with Google Maps. <laughs> put your hands together for a vamp first-timer, Patrick Tuig.